Hello everyone, this advanced EKG video will cover the subtypes of atrial flutter. It will assume some very basic knowledge of what flutter looks like and the general physiologic mechanism of reentry. After this video, you'll be able to describe right atrial anatomy as it relates to the development of atrial flutter, to identify the major subtypes of flutter on EKG and describe the likely location of their reentry circuits, and to describe the limitations of correlating EKG appearance of an apparent flutter with its underlying electrophysiologic mechanism. So here's a representative example of atrial flutter. You've presumably seen this rhythm before with the characteristic sawtooth flutter waves, best seen in the inferior leads. Atrial flutter has been traditionally defined by four criteria, a rhythm with regular atrial activity occurring at least as frequently as 240 atrial depolarizations per minute, that is at least 240 flutter waves per minute, and with an absence of an isoelectric baseline in at least one EKG lead. And the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism is a macroscopic reentry circuit within one of the atria. Unfortunately, there are some problems with this traditional definition that I'll return to at the end, but let's stick with this for now. In order to understand the pathophysiology of different subtypes of atrial flutter, it's necessary to briefly review atrial anatomy, specifically right atrial anatomy, since the overwhelming majority of atrial flutter originates in the right atrium. Here's a cutaway view of the right side of the heart. Since it's a view you might not be familiar with, to orient you, here's the right ventricle and the right atrium. The right atrium can be divided into two halves in which the anterior lateral trabeculated half is derived from the true embryonic right atrium, while the smooth walled posterior medial half is derived from the sinus venosus. Separating these two halves are the eustachian ridge and the crista terminalis. In addition to these structures, the endocardial surface of the right atrium has several orifices which can serve as anatomic barriers to electrical conduction. The most notable of these orifices are the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, which enters the atrium posterior to the eustachian ridge, and of course, there's the tricuspid valve, which has been cut away in this image, but which is attached to the tricuspid annulus that comes out of the plane of the screen like this. This structure here is the fossa ovalis. This is the original location of the foramen ovale, which allows blood to travel from the right atrium to the left atrium during fetal development. When talking about atrial flutter, the single most important part of the right atrium is one you may have never heard of before, the cavotricuspid isthmus, often either abbreviated as CTI or referred to as just the isthmus. This region of tissue is bounded anteriorly by the tricuspid annulus and posteriorly by the eustachian ridge and the IVC. The reason it's notable is because in some patients, electrical impulses cross the isthmus unusually slowly compared to the surrounding atrial tissue. The combination of slowed conduction and the naturally occurring anatomic barriers to conduction that surround it create the perfect substrate for the development of a reentrant circuit. In the most common form of flutter, the reentrant circuit travels counterclockwise as viewed from the front of the patient. The wavefront of depolarization descends the lateral wall, passing slowly through the cavotricuspid isthmus, and then rapidly back up the intraatrial septum, encircling the right atrium posterior to the tricuspid annulus. Now, let's talk about the classification of atrial flutter. If you haven't figured it out already, I'm not talking about flutter with fixed block versus flutter with variable block, or 4 to 1 flutter versus 2 to 1 flutter. While those are important distinctions that I've discussed in prior videos in this series, it's not how a cardiologist thinks about flutter. Cardiologists categorize flutters as being either isthmus dependent, meaning the flutter circuit passes through the cavotricuspid isthmus, or isthmus independent. By a significant margin, the most common form of flutter overall is the one that uses the circuit I showed a minute ago. Typical counterclockwise flutter. An arrhythmia can use that same anatomic circuit but in the opposite direction, resulting in reverse typical flutter, also known as clockwise flutter. There is a much rarer flutter circuit that still uses the isthmus called lower loop reentry that I'll show a picture of in a minute. There are a few other even rarer isthmus dependent circuits that you'll never need to worry about unless you become an electrophysiologist.
In contrast to the well-defined isthmus-dependent flutter circuits, the circuits of isthmus-independent flutter are much more numerous and diverse. Reentry circuits can form around all kinds of anatomic barriers, such as the SVC, pulmonary veins, scars, suture lines, the mitral valve, and more. If not already apparent, all isthmus-dependent flutters must necessarily be within the right atrium, while isthmus-independent flutters can be within either the right or the left atrium. The reason that cardiologists classify atrial flutter primarily based on isthmus dependence is because isthmus dependent flutter can be easily cured by endovascular ablation of the isthmus. Isthmus independent flutter can still be mapped in the EP lab and also ablated, but this is technically more challenging and less often successful. At this point, I'm going to discuss the specific EKG features of different forms of atrial flutter, starting with typical counterclockwise flutter. Here we see the classic sawtooth waves in the inferior leads. The sawtooth waves in typical flutter specifically have a steep upstroke and a more shallow downstroke. This morphology is sometimes referred to as, quote, negative flutter waves, which I've never really understood since almost by definition, there's no isoelectrical baseline here to compare the deflection to. So I don't personally use that terminology. Another finding in typical flutter is in V1, where there is an isoelectric segment that separates positive waveforms that look like rapidly occurring P waves. There is an interesting morphologic feature to typical inferior flutter waves. When most people hear the term sawtooth, the image that's formed is one of straight lines and sharp angles. But actually, the flutter waves have a particularly deep nadir and a rounded top. In this example EKG, if we zoom in on lead 3, we can see a nice example of that. The reason this is important is because in some people with flutter, the peaks and valleys of the flutter waves can be unusually prominent, obscuring the overall sawtooth nature and giving an appearance more suggestive of an atypical flutter or an atrial tachycardia. Here is an example of reverse typical or clockwise flutter. This is seen when the depolarization wavefront moves up the lateral free wall, medially across the top of the right atrium, down the intraatrial septum, and laterally across the isthmus. On EKG, the flutter waves in the inferior leads are usually positive and often notched. Atrial depolarizations in V1 are negative and relatively broad, and are sometimes notched. Depending on the size and resolution of your screen, you may or may not be able to see the notching of the flutter waves, so let me zoom in on lead 3 here. Overall, there is greater variability in the appearance of reverse typical flutter than in that of typical flutter. In lower loop reentry flutter, the IVC forms the central area of block and the reentrant wavefronts of depolarization simply travel around the IVC's entrance into the right atrium, including passing through the isthmus. The left atrium is passively depolarized in similar fashion to typical flutter, resulting in negative atrial complexes in the inferior leads, but otherwise its appearance can be variable and resemble either typical, reverse typical, or an atypical flutter. A quick note about a quirk in terminology. While the term typical flutter is reserved for the preceding flutter circuit that encircled the tricuspid annulus, the term atypical flutter is usually reserved for isthmus independent flutter. This makes lower loop flutter and a few other even rare variants neither typical nor atypical. So now I'll move on to isthmus independent flutter, also called atypical flutter, as I've just mentioned. While I'll show some representative examples of atypical flutter, it's important to realize that depending upon where the circuit is located, just about any EKG pattern can be seen, from ones that look like a classic atrial tachycardia to one that is indistinguishable from typical counterclockwise flutter. An invasive EP study is usually necessary to definitively diagnose them. So here's the first of two examples. The first thing you might notice is the rapid atrial activity in the inferior leads that almost looks sawtooth-like, particularly in lead 3. But the flutter wave is too symmetric in 2 and AVF to be considered consistent with typical flutter. They also lack the distinctive deep nadir that I pointed out on the typical counterclockwise flutter example. So from this, it suggests an isthmus-independent flutter. 
Then to determine which atria it's most likely located in, look at V1. If the flutter waves in V1 are predominantly negative, it suggests a right atrial circuit, though this rule is not close to being absolute. And then in this example, once again we see a very rapid atrial activity in the inferior leads that lacks the typical sawtooth morphology, suggesting we probably have an isthmus independent flutter. But unlike the last example, there are positive waves in V1, suggesting that a left atrial reentrant circuit is responsible. I'd like to return to the traditional definition of atrial flutter with which I opened the video. I mentioned that there were some problems with this definition, some of which you may have already realized. First, not all rhythms which appear to be atrial flutter on EKG are the result of macro reentry, and not all macro reentrant rhythms within the atria result in easily distinguished flutter waves. In other words, there's not always a clear division between atrial flutter and atrial tachycardia. The rate of flutter waves may be slower than 240 waves per minute for a variety of reasons, most commonly due to the use of class 1C antirhythmics. And while not a problem specifically with the definition of flutter, the electrocardiographic features are not perfectly predictive of the location of the reentry circuit, particularly when those reentry circuits are isthmus independent. That's it for the topic of atrial flutter subtypes. If you found this helpful, please check out the other videos in this series on EKG interpretation.